this girl had glandular fever. She couldn't go to this ball that was on. It was all very mythic and fairy tale like. And I was just drawn to put my thumb on her forehead, and I didn't know why. I didn't even really feel myself doing that. And then 30 seconds later, she was fine. And that was the kind of experience where I was like, I don't have a context for that. I've never heard of anything like this occurring, but it just sort of happened through me. And it raised the question that I'm still trying to answer really is like, what was that? And is there a way to replicate that? Is there a way to use that? What do you do with that? Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Finding Equilibrium show. Delighted to be here, delighted that you're here, and delighted that my guest today is Chris Skidmore. Chris is an astrologer, a psychotherapist, and a body worker, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to speak to Chris today. Welcome, Chris, and you're you're in Bali. I can see from your background, it looks... Uh, I am. It looks a yeah. very, very nice uh, background indeed. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks for having me on the show and, and uh, good to be here. Good to meet you all in the audience. One thing that when we we met, we probably met only a year or so ago, um, but what I'm really interested when I when, when we met was how you blend three quite different um, disciplines or modalities together. So I'd love for people who aren't familiar with your work, I'd love you to share a little bit about how you came to uh, to do the works that you do today. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty fascinating story in a way. I, I actually, um, I'm from Perth, Western Australia. I came through, you know, the school system there. I went to the University of Western Australia. I studied marketing and economics. I got a degree in those things. And uh, and then I went traveling and and I had a series of, of experiences that I couldn't really uh, comprehend and couldn't really fully grasp as far as what it all meant and uh, one was a moment of kind of a spontaneous healing moment that happened um, I was actually living above a pub in the uh, in the northwest of of England and this this woman had glandular fever this this girl I suppose that I was working with had glandular fever she couldn't go to this ball that was on it was all very mythic and fairy tale like and I was just drawn to put my thumb on a on her forehead and I didn't know why I didn't know I didn't even really feel myself doing that and then 30 seconds later the the she was fine um wow. and that was the kind of experience where I was like I don't have a context for that I don't I've never heard of anything like this occurring and but it just sort of happened through me and it raised the question that I'm still trying to ask answer really is like what was that and is there a way to replicate that? Is there a way to use that? What do you do with that? Um, a whole series of, of questions come out of that, you know? Um, so then if I fast forward from that moment, eventually, uh, you know, maybe six six years later or something, I, I was introduced to a form of body work called craniosacral therapy, which is the specifically biodynamic is the, is the form that I practice. And it's really putting your hands on the system, on the body, and then just waiting for that system to respond to the touch. So the training is a very gentle, uh, nuanced kind of a touch therapy. And then you'd learn to listen with your hands. I would say that's the best way to, to yeah. describe the work as far as I experience it. Because mm. when I can really tune in and listen with my hands, which are amazing sensory organs, aren't they? I mean, we know that because just how many nerve endings mm. are in there and how sensitive they can be, mm. especially if we turn off our modern minds and really attune with the hands, which of course every mother knows how to do. And, you know, like there's a sense of, there's a sense of that being something very innate in the human experience, but maybe something that we don't, focus on or use anymore. I don't know. Like it, it just seems to be hands are like utility vehicles now, but this kind of retaught me the, uh, the purpose of really listening with the hands. And then I started to experience all these things that go on in a body. And, um, uh, and so you go, I mean, cranio is the head and sacral is the tail, right? Like that's the top and the bottom of the spine. It works with the cerebrospinal fluid that goes up and down the spine and around the brain. That's the most technical I'll get with it you know, mm. but, um, but actually it's like, it helped me to see this multi-layered, um, 
multi-layered reality that was going on in the body, you know, like all the stories that we hold and the tensions and the traumas and everything. And I started to just learn that really bottom up learning, you know? Um, and so this information that I was getting and the sessions that I was having, they, they were, and the learning that was happening as well. I had a really great teacher. His name's Gary Rober. Um, and I sort of stayed in, in mentorship with him for quite some time. Um, so that was one, I mean, I might pause there if you've got, before I rush on to the other things. <laughs> no, it's interesting. <laughs> and it's definitely worth taking a break where we can kind yeah. of digest what you just said. So I guess where I'm curious when, when I hear you speak is what types of, if you fast forward to today, what types of conditions would you treat with cranio? sacral um therapy sorry I, I, for some reason i'm having a struggling with that term but it's a wordy one it is a wordy one, one. but I'm, yeah. I'm curious like it's fascinating to me to hear your initial experience with the thumb you know it's fascinating yeah. and now yeah. you've kind of developed this this talent but what types mm. of people respond to that type of treatment I mean, so many different things come through my door, you know, from um, more like I, I can tell you one client this week came in with tinnitus and uh, and and sort of several post-concussion syndrome symptoms. Um, and it was really fascinating. We 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 got into the this vision that came while while I was doing the treatment. So my hands are on and um, and we sort of got this sense of this helmet that was sort of blocking her vision and things. And we started to work with that image as well as working with what she was experiencing in her body, for instance, right? But I've had many different types of, um, so it can work all the way from the dense physical stuff all the way to the very much more, uh, I guess, maybe they would say psychosomatic or whatever you would say, you know, maybe, maybe more anxiety and these kinds of things. Cause mm. If you think about the cerebrospinal fluid, it's going around the brain and up and down the, the spine. Um, oh, that's where that's its path, right? That's its path. So in some ways it's a it's like a bit of a physical manifestation of the nervous system. So if you can get that to flow, there's there can be a deep sense of like relaxation in the system. And then when the system is in relaxation, all sorts of healing happens because mm -hmm. it's like rest and digest, you know, like the parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of rest and digest and if you can deliver someone back to the parasympathetic nervous system which in the modern day we're often stuck in the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight we're often really charged up you know so it's interesting the name of your podcast is is you know the, this this concept of equilibrium uh, and that that is a level of equilibrium that i find sometimes can happen where someone can get off the table and there's this deep hum that has returned to the system and this sense of like calm and almost like, cause it's also a shock absorber, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the cerebrospinal fluid is a shock absorber. So like you can absorb more, you can be more resilient. And I've seen all sorts of interesting things. I've never seen what happened to me in my early twenties happen again, right? Where it's like one Yet. touch cured. <laughs> um, but maybe that was just like a glimpse for me of what was mm. what was available through touch. You know, mm. I think it, it was just like an interruption from some kind of a force in the universe that said, like, "Hey, this is also possible." Mm. And I was sort of there for it, and and I felt mm. like something came through and. And I wanted to make my life in some ways in service to that thing, even though I didn't really know what it was. I didn't mm. have a context for it. I'm Australian like yourself. And I was just sort of like in this, I'm I'm raised in a culture that doesn't really think about things like that. So it's very foreign uh, to me, you know, but mm. because it was so visceral and so real, I, I decided that I'm going to just take a different path. And it was an it was enough of a glimpse into some other reality that I I felt mm. like it would be remiss of me not to keep going down well, this path yeah. and find out you know yeah I mean clearly it was very significant you know marked in economics and uh, and the path that you followed you know, in a some ways different. they're they're very different <laughs> uh, although I'm sure they they'll come together at some at some point in a way uh, yeah yeah so just just kind of moving on from there so I so I understand the calling to do that type of body work and the and the and the way it uh, the way it works and why people can benefit i'm curious where the psychotherapy and the astrology came in like what was mm. the um the pathway to um to training to be a psychotherapist for instance 
or what came yeah. first? Was it so astrology? So the astrology came first, astrology actually. Came first, okay. um, yeah, and I had a friend that I traveled with because I was sort of traveling around Europe for a little while and and just enjoying things in my early twenties. Like after I finished university, as many of us do, I I went on a bit of a journey and solo trip, and <clears throat> sometimes with friends, sometimes solo. But I met a I met somebody on the road who became a dear friend and. She was starting to get into astrology and I had no concept of it at all at the time. Um, I just knew the sort of sun sign stuff. Um, and she was she was really getting deep into it, you know, but I was pretty open to everything at that time, especially from that experience. It opened me to all sorts of different things. So she started to tell me about my moon sign and that really piqued my attention because I didn't I didn't relate as much to my sun sign. But when she told me about my moon sign, I was like, well, that just summarizes so many experiences and troubles I have and difficulties as well as gifts. And yeah. so that lunar lunar component of astrology really um then I was a bit hooked actually. I wanted to know more, I kept trying to find out a little bit more. And then, you know, in 2008, I came to um I came to Bali. I had quit the job that I was working. I came to Bali and just had a, a year here of exploration. And I ended up learning with a few really amazing teachers like Melanie Reinhardt and Stephen Forrest, if anybody knows mm. those two. They they were doing a thing here 10 days. And once I did that, I saw, kind of saw, wow, you can do that with astrology. What those guys were doing with it was uh, just at a whole nother level. And so that that to me was like, okay, I don't, this is obviously not the thing that I was reading as a kid in the newspaper in that section in the middle, <laughs> you know, like looking at my, yes, you know, looking the at one twelfth of the, yeah, the horoscopes, <laughs> you know, like it, it's, yeah, looking at how one twelfth of the population are having this kind of day. This is a much more detailed, personal and ancient wisdom tradition. And, and, uh, that's what I felt about, about it. And, Again, and you know, I was learning the cranial sacral, but I also I got a deep uh like I got bitten by the astrology bug. And particularly for me, I was getting into Joseph Campbell and all that kind of stuff at the time and Hero with a Thousand Faces or the mythic threads. Mm. And so that became like, oh, so this fits in there. I started to I was gifted a few books of astrology that was really working more mythically, and that just spoke my language. I was like, if I could learn to do this, I reckon I'd be really happy. You know, <laughs> wow. So you went down that path and then so I went down that path as well. You know, yeah. I kind of went a parallel path where the, the, the cranial circle was, I was learning that and I was also learning astrology and I couldn't see how the two would ever really weave. Mm. It felt like a bit of a split really. How is this ever going to work? Cause both of them take so much of my time to learn, mm. but I just kept topics. going. Yeah. Enormous topics, but I just kept going with it. You know, I, I studied and studied and studied. I, I would just do odd jobs to, I mean, I taught English in Taiwan. I did different things just to make money while I was learning. Mm. And then in 2016, I was offered a job here in, um, in, uh, in Bali in a, at a yoga studio that was just like re revamping their healing center and because I just graduated, so I went and studied craniosacral. I did like a two-year diploma in it. And after graduating, I I came here to Bali and I got a job. And in the interview, she said, do you offer anything else besides craniosacral? And I said, oh, well, that's funny you should say that because I've been like 15 years. I've been hanging around astrology, you know, like it's been a big part of my life. And I had actually studied at that point at the London Faculty of Astrology too. So okay. I said yes, and then I started to offer both of those um, in this healing department of a yoga studio okay. in Bali. So yeah. you were doing body work and you were reading charts for people. So basically okay. it was like probably 70 to 80% body work, and then I do maybe 20% of the time charts. But I loved the astrology. Every time I got an astrology session, I was so excited, and I that's, the charts were really humming, and I could really – I was getting some great results of, of the – uh, interactions that were happening and I realized I was doing counseling of some kind you know I realized that and that's what that's what sort of drew me to go back to school because the things that were coming up were so much in the psyche that I wanted to be qualified to work with that I felt a little underqualified with the kind of things that were coming up and that's what led me back to school and that's to become a psychotherapist yeah that's it okay, yeah wow so uh, mm. thank you for sharing that. So now how do you sew it all together? Is it still different services or do you blend them for individual 
clients. Yeah, now it's different. much more blended. Yeah, I mean, so I call it on the website, on my website, it's uh, it's the three threads that I'm weaving together. And sometimes I'll lean more heavily from one to the other. And sometimes I won't do craniosacral for quite a while until it sort of arises that it's time for that. I, I would say probably the psychotherapy, even though it's the last thing that I learned, is probably the front running thing that I do now. Um, but then those other two things, they feed into it so beautifully. So it's much more woven. I'm still working on the weave, you know, but I but I I feel it uh much more fluidly. And I think the thing that's helped me is um about three years ago, I was reading one of Brian Clark, who you've had on the podcast. I was reading one of his books, Soul Symbol Imagination. I was like, this guy's speaking to me. So I sent him an email and asked him, you know, sent him my website, sent him what I'm about and asked him if he'd be up for being sort of a mentor figure. And uh, to my great surprise and and thrill, he agreed. And so we've basically seen each other every two weeks for three years over Zoom. Oh, yeah. And and so that has helped me to learn the mythology. And I think that's been like this click uh, of a piece, which puts, which really is the ocean in which all of this can live in, in a sense, you know, like I, that's really the net underneath it all. So that's kind of a secret fourth thing in the mythology, specifically Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. And I do use fairy tales as well. And, um, Grimm brothers usually, and, you know, all these stories have this ancient wisdom. So the, um, I'm curious, just picking up on that point, how the um, mythology is the net and, and may maybe what you could do is bring, bring it to life. So when you're actually working with a, a person, how would they present themselves? So would they so they, they would start with the psychotherapy needs, uh, so more of a mental mental health uh, kind of focus, and then you would wo weave through other services um, that that, mm. that that you offer. Is that typically how it um, how it would work? Yeah, people come and uh, you know something's going on. Usually, something is the catalyst to bring somebody in, and and um, you know because now I'm, I'm I'm a psychotherapist, it's more like being able to do weekly sessions or ongoing work. That's what that really opened up for me. And then what happens is I'll have the chart with me, you know, and then the chart will tell a story. Um, and so we'll be working with something in the chart and the life, and then a story may just kind of like pop up, you know. So for instance, maybe we're working with something and I won't go too specific, but um, you know, something might show up in the chart and a, and a myth say Medusa is a really good myth for the, for the trauma process where Medusa herself has been frozen and everyone she looks at freezes and she's got sn tangled snake hair. That's a really nice image for when we're feeling that freeze. And when we're feeling like we don't want to look at people or we don't want people to look at us. And then we can follow that journey especially if there's signatures of that myth in the chart and the person's already told me signatures of that or hinted at signatures of that. And so then something like that, like that story may come through, the symbols in the chart may come through. We're talking about life factors. That's the psychotherapeutic element. And we may even take that to the table of where in your body is frozen, what part of your body is experiencing this Medusa experience, you know, like, so we we go on all those levels. Of course, it's rare that I'd be able to do all four of those things, you know, in the one session. But over time, you know, it it becomes more. It becomes more flowing. Yeah. Amazing. And what types of results would um, people get? Yeah. So results wise, I mean, I tend to think that this is soul work and there's a real deep contemplative thing that's happening in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily focus on that, that, that here's the thing that's going to happen, but it does happen sometimes that something will really shift and you know, that like some kind of a, um, or, or even a difference in strategy that say a myth can help with. So the next time you encounter that same thing, you've got like a mythic background to that or or if the nervous system is settled more then that can be that can also impact di several different areas of life and so you know it's tricky because it is a bit oceanic so there's all sorts of different things that can happen and i tend to focus on like this is a reflective kind of process and you know we're developing soul and that's what i that's why i call 
uh, my thing on the soul's terms. And, you know, that, that's, that, that's how I want it to be according to the soul, which means mm. that deep, deep inner restful place that we can return back to, you know, the, the, in Latin, it was called anima, uh, and soul psyche, the butterfly, it's all the same basic image that, mm. that when we come back to that, that, we get all sorts of, of great kind of results that happen but i don't tend to myself focus on those results because god i don't know i don't know what's going to happen sure but yeah the, i guess what i'm hearing you say is that the people who really want to work on their soul's journey um in, yeah. in this lifetime will get value from from working with you in the way that in the way that you blend the different tools together yeah well i certainly hope so yeah no it's it, it <laughs> it's amazing i'm curious the whole mythology um piece fascinates me as well and i'm sure it will fascinate many of our um our um our listeners and um, what was it that really connected with to, with you around mythology is that something you'd always been interested in as a child or what what was the um the catalyst that um yeah that opened up that uh, that doorway I guess a lot of my reading uh, through astrology definitely opened it up because mm. I, I I had read some Liz Green and some Howard Sasportes and those are the kind of characters that do work more with mythology. So every time they'd talk mythology in the with the with in the background of astrology, I'd be like my ears would be pricked up, right? And as I said, I was also getting into the Joseph Campbell, who's a if you haven't heard of Joseph Campbell, probably most people have, but if you haven't heard of him, he's you know, really a, a comparative religious scholar where he takes religions and, and cosmologies and mythologies from all over the world and blends them in, you know, like finds the common threads and common themes within those. We wouldn't have Star Wars if it weren't for Joseph Campbell. So he's made a pretty big contribution to the modern uh, to modern era. Um, so reading a little bit of him, but even when I was reading him, I was like, I want the story. How do I find just the story? And it took me a really long time before I could just really find the sources that would give me just the story, not with the analysis and not with that. So it means this and not even a Jungian analysis. So I wanted just the story. Um, so what's helped me recently is to have with Brian's Brian Clark's help, who's he's a classic scholar, you know, he's that that's his background. And so through him, I've been able to really connect back to the source material. You know, now I have a now I have a classics 101 book, for instance, a textbook that they give to university. And I'm really able to go in to the myths, which means that I can just be with the images, like not, not already kind of uh, interpreted for me or not helped to make me understand. I can just mm -hmm. be with like, what is that image for me now? And that's how I like to work with the client, with a client, not for me to tell them. So this means that. For me just to tell a little bit of a story and see if they can feel mm. and, and what their response is and where that takes them because that's the beauty of mythology you know it's it's like it's something we've always used to heal and to teach each other and to prepare each other for different phases of life and for transitions and for death mm. and birth and rebirths and you know, all these things mm. they happen they happen but they happen with a magical background right there's magic in there strange things are happening the gods in greek mythology that in the Greek mythology, a lot of the gods are against each other. And so you get the sense of antagonism going on, you know, why is there antagonism there? And, and does that reflect parts of myself that are also antagonistic towards each other? And how can I help resolve that conflict in me as the mere human, the mere mortal? But even seeing that the gods have that much trouble is actually very relieving to me. <laughs> Yeah, how, like it's absolutely a fascinating area, and um, it's so we could we could talk a lot a lot more about this, but you know, time uh, as always isn't on our side. Yeah. So, so this uh, this this podcast is very much focused on helping people to find equilibrium, to find balance, to find for, to find harmony in their um, in their lives. And when I say those words to you personally, you know, the the two questions really what what. What do they mean to you? So what does finding equilibrium mean to you? And what do you do personally to keep yourself in, um, in equilibrium? 
Yeah. So the word actually means all sorts of different things to me, to be honest, because on the one hand, I can feel that from the craniosacral body work perspective, getting back in touch with that parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, and the entirety of the body and mind works better when we're in touch with that system. So mm. that to me is one form of equilibrium. But for, from my other work as well, it's like within astrology, it really talks about the different parts. And of course, nowadays that's internal family systems and what have you. Um, and so how to get those parts working on the same team, they don't have to get along. I've learned that one. I don't need to make them get along because I can lose some of the potency if I make them get along, but I want them working on the same team. And when they're on the same team, I'm more creative, more vibrant, and therefore I have that equilibrium too. So that would be the two areas that I feel. I mean, there's many more as well, of course, but those two pop up for me. Mm, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And what it means to me, um, or how I how I go about creating equilibrium in my life, it's a good question. You know, I've I've done vipassana meditations, for for instance, and I I certainly feel like I'm I'm feeling pretty good when I'm doing longer meditations, and that certainly helps. Um, but to be honest, it's like it's like just just paying attention to the many different things in my life that have demands on me. And trying to just kind of keep a, an even keel around that and an understanding that the older I get, the more kind of demands there are. And I can't meet them all, you know, but understanding, like, for instance, a client came in the other day, you know, and we talked about these areas, um, the family, the career, the relationship. That's what she said, those three. And she was missing the fourth element, which is the self. You know, so that was instructive in itself. But I like those, like, if I can find harmony between my home life, my career, my relationship and relationships and myself and self-care, if I can get that, it's like I have the grand cross of astrology, right? I have the grand cross in the middle and that yeah, can help stabilize 100%. me and get, get me going, you know? 100%, yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. And I think astrology very much helps you find equilibrium because you can see, A lot. you know, because astrology is not about good or bad. It is about finding harmony between all the exactly different, right. <laughs> different yeah, exactly uh, right. areas that may be pulling you in very different uh, directions right yeah exactly <laughs> but chris thank yeah. you so much let me uh, i'd love to acknowledge you for all the work you're doing i mean it's incredible work um you know you very much are a, a forerunner and uh, i know you're doing a lot of um you run your own podcast so i'd love you to share where people can find out more about your work you know maybe book appointments if um if you run those i know you're in bali but if you run those remotely um um as well as uh, as well as um you know how people can uh, get in touch with you Sure. Yeah. If you go to my website, it's got everything there on the souls terms.com on the souls terms.com just in one as one word, you can book sessions there. You can listen to the podcast there. I also have a blog there, which I've just written a few things up there and, um, and you can do, and you can also send me to my WhatsApp, my, my business WhatsApp or my email. It's really all on there. Um, and you can book, on zoom or in person if anybody's coming to bali or is in or is in bali you can do it in person and if not i do zoom sessions 60 minutes 90 minutes uh and it's really all there so um more than welcome to to come and check it out have a look at your own chart or if you're in bali come and experience the craniosacral whatever it is amazing thank you so much chris thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us today and thank you, everyone, for your time and for your attention. And we'll see you soon. Take care now.